All right, Jordan Feigenbaum, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, so you've got a really interesting background. You're a starting strength coach, a dietitian, and a medical doctor, an actual medical doctor. Uh, can you walk us through your CV and how your experience in different but related fields in health and fitness has shaped your philosophy towards uh, fitness? Uh, sure, yeah. It's, um, so it's been an interesting journey. Uh, I went to undergrad, got a biology degree from Truman State University, <clears throat> graduated in 2008. And actually, I wasn't pre-med or pre-anything, which is an interesting you know, thing to get a biology degree because what do you do with the bio degree? There's, not, there's nothing you can do uh, unless you want to go research or uh, go into a professional field. But I wanted a science degree and uh, I came out, started coaching people at the gym because that's the only thing I was really interested in doing and uh, did that for about five years over the course of that. Uh, got my starting strength coach. Uh, I started doing that, <clears throat> started working on staff uh, at the starting strength seminars and doing my own thing, coaching people privately at a, at a separate facility. And, uh, yeah, I got to a point where, um, I was coaching a lot of people. It was really fun. I love coaching. Um, but I wanted to have a bigger platform to, uh, get some of these ideas out there as far as using, uh, strength training and nutritional changes and lifestyle modification overall to, as a sort of, you know, preventative health, uh, uh, sort of, uh, sort of thing. And so I, I realized <clears throat> no matter how many certifications I got or how long I was coaching that uh, I would never have enough cachet to uh, sort of be a big voice in the, in the public sector. So I thought, uh, well, let's go back. Let's get a medical degree. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> no biggie. It's like seven years, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's no big, well, so yeah, I actually had to go back. I got my master's uh, in anatomy and physiology uh, from St. Louis University School of Medicine. I did that first to kind of bone up on my my application to medical school because it's super competitive. Uh, so I did that. That was two years. And then I got into uh, medical school at uh, Eastern Virginia Medical School uh, out in Norfolk. So that was another four years. Um, and then after that, uh, yeah, I started my residency here at UCLA um, in Santa Monica. And uh, that's where I'm at now. So uh, doing all this to sort of gain enough training and knowledge and sort of uh, again, this sort of cachet, like, oh, well, he's a doctor. We have to listen to him, which sounds silly. I mean, I understand it sounds silly, but, um, you know, I recognize the public as def will definitely uh, be more receptive to a message from a physician, whether that's right or wrong, um, as far as lifestyle changes go. And so, again, it's been my passion for a long time. I, I love coaching. I love the strength training just myself anyway. Um, and, and yet now that I can sort of be, uh, the, have the medical aspect on the end of it, I feel like it's going to, uh, uh, be helpful in getting the message out to the public. So the long story short, I've been through a lot of school. <laughs> I've done a lot of, uh, 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 of academic related things and, uh, hopefully this will pay off, uh, as I try to get this message out there. Right. And so, I mean, that's interesting because people do listen to physicians about when it comes to their health and their lifestyle. And, you know, you're a proponent of barbell training, you're a starting strength coach, but barbell training has a bad rep in the medical field amongst physicians, physical therapists. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, in your experience dealing with, you know, being a medical student, um, dealing with physicians, what are some of the most, the common misconceptions that you see doctors have about barbell and strength training? Oh, yeah. So uh, when I was in medical school, I mean, <clears throat> I constantly would get challenged by the attendings or even the residents. You know, why would you recommend somebody do barbell training? It's uh, one, you know, there'd be multiple lines of arguments. The first would be, oh, it's dangerous. The second would be, you know, how can you be sure that it's effective? Or, you know, why don't we just, why don't we just have them walk? If they just walk more, it'll be fine. So, you know, and, and I, at, since I graduated medical school and started residency, I have a little bit more autonomy, you know, because now I'm no longer reporting to, you know, a middleman. I'm kind of just seeing patients and, and, and doing that, which is, which is nice. So I, I've had to like deconstruct these over the years and, and come up with rebuttals. So, you know, the first, the first thing and probably what most people will, uh, or most physicians or clinicians will suggest is that barbell training is inherently dangerous, which is not supported by any evidence at all, actually. So, and, you know, when I say these statistics or, or these, you know, short little sound bites that the people, the people will love to hear, 
uh, that's taking into consideration all the limitations of the data, which is people underreporting injuries or how they define injuries are not, you know, the same between studies. So, you know, take that at, at face value. But the injury rate for competitive weightlifting, all right, where the weight on the bar matters more than anything else, all right? So you'd expect a, a higher injury rate uh, <laughs> than in the general public is 0. 0.000030. Uh, six uh, injuries per thousand participation hours. So, you know, a very small fraction uh, compared to soccer, which is a uh, uh, six. <laughs> so it's a, you know, a thousand times greater. Um, and, and so, and that's just one study. There's multiple studies that have looked at this. And, you know, the injury rate from barbell training is just so low to just not, it's a, it's an outlier. It's a, it, you know, it's a, it's an error bar. You just don't even worry about it, especially when you consider the benefits. So, you know, e every medication, even over the counter stuff has a risk benefit profile, right? And so we're always constantly assessing, you know, do the benefits outweigh the risks or vice versa for this treatment or intervention? Well, barbell training, training in general, just has such a high upside, such a great benefit profile compared to the perceived risks, which don't even appear to be that great. Uh, <laughs> it, it's just funny to me that we wouldn't push this on everyone. You know, we were afraid of somebody getting hurt and it's like, well, that's, we, we don't recommend against soccer, right? Or we don't recommend against, uh, um, you know, other activities that have a higher risk profile than, than, uh, than barbell training. So the, the injury thing to me is silly. It just, uh, that just tells me some, no one's ever, they haven't looked at the data. They have no experience with the, you know, training themselves. So can't really, can't really support that. Um, the second thing is a little bit more nuanced, you know, there is barbell training effective. And then this, you have to have a secondary question is, is it effective for a certain outcome? So I need to know, you know, what outcomes from, are somebody looking at? If they want to say weight loss, um, I feel like that's almost too, it's too nebulous or it's too, uh, multifactorial to actually say equivocal, you know, unequivocally that barbell training is better or is helpful for that. I mean, weight loss by and large if you look at long-term studies on any intervention for weight loss, except for surgery, it's poor. So le legitimately, any diet that's ever been looked at in the, in the literature has terrible outcomes at like a five-year and 10-year mark. Um, <laughs> almost everybody, and I would say almost every, like 95 to 99% of people who undergo a dietary change at five and 10 years will have either regained either almost all of the weight that they've lost or more than they lost. That's depressing. Unless it is depressing. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely another question, maybe even another podcast. But, you know, people get really bummed out. They're like, oh, well, you know, they, did, they didn't go low carb enough or they didn't do intermittent fasting or they didn't do this particular type of diet that, you know, the person who's arguing for it has, is currently doing. It's like, well, I would argue that whatever sort of counseling method or accountability method that that person's using is not enough to keep them compliant. A, and then whatever physical activity that they're doing is not enough B. And so the physical activity aspect of it is kind of where barbell training comes in. Um, if you look at what barbell training has the potential to do as sort of a, uh, not only a physical like 401k is how I like to refer to it as, uh, but also how it affects people's metabolism compared to something like running, walking, or, uh, you know, other activities, yoga, Pilates, whatever the potential for barbell training to uh, improve glucose talent tolerance. So how we handle sugar to increase uh, metabolism overall, because uh, as a, effectively causing a person to burn more calories, um, uh, making them stronger, increasing their uh, bone mineral density, uh, you know, increasing their functional work capacity, their ability to do activities of daily life. Like, Barbell training is much more potent than any other training modality there is. And, and so when you look at it from a time, you know, an economy-based uh, uh, perspective, you just barbell training it, it is, is the king. It doesn't mean that people shouldn't do other stuff if they want to or if they have time. Um, it just means that, in my opinion, barbell training is the base of the pyramid. If someone only has you know, three hours a week to train or to exercise, they should be doing barbell training. It's just the most effective use of that time. Um, and I think that gets more and more important as someone gets older, mainly because someone who's unable to uh, 
do their activities of daily life without assistance, um, you know, putting, you know, put, putting dishes away, cleaning around the house, getting up to the shower or, to, you know, take a bath or to the bathroom by themselves because they're so weak, that person needs to go into a skilled nursing facility, a long-term care facility. And that's not only big money, but that's a, ter- you know, that's a poor quality of life. So I don't really care what, you know, how, how, far, uh, uh, how fast they can run a mile at that point. <laughs> that's, that's beyond. Uh, I'd rather, I, I need to know how strong they are, you know? Um, and that, that's also, uh, I know I've been r- rambling on for a little bit, but that's also actually supported by data. When you look at, uh, functional outcomes of elderly people, um, the, it's very tightly correlated to that, their strength, uh, the strength or, and or power, which power is just a, you know, a proxy for, uh, of, of strength. Uh, so it's just interesting. I don't know. I, I, I guess I don't get why these very learned individuals in the medical field are so against barbell training. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's not supported by evidence. I just think we intuitively feel like, Ooh, it's dangerous. Or mm, since I don't know much about it, uh, maybe it's not that effective. It's like, well, you just haven't looked at it. Right. Haven't looked at it close enough. And and besides the, um, the, the exercise component, I mean, what about myths about diet that exist amongst medical doctors? I mean, oh, man. things, things like, you know, don't eat too much protein because you're going to, it's, it's bad for your, your kidneys or, you know, things like that. Uh, Why, what are some other myths like that that exist in the medical field? Yeah. Just to briefly on the <clears throat> protein kidney thing, that's super interesting uh, to me. I'm actually writing a piece uh, for the starting strength website uh, called <laughs> it's uh, the problem with protein and kidneys. So that'll be, it's not very, it's not a very sexy title, but uh, we'll, uh, <laughs> it should be, it's pretty, it's pretty thorough. Um, there's actually not evidence to suggest that people eating a higher protein diet have negative changes in their kidney function. They tend to be adaptive changes in how the kidneys filtering and processing uh, the, basically the blood. Uh, you know, that's effectively what the kidneys do. And they just keep filtering the blood, uh, you know, all throughout the day. So it just tends to be like an adaptive change. Once you have more protein, it just does it a little differently and adapts accordingly. That's your body is able to adapt to different things. So it, that's going to be an interesting article. But from a dietary perspective, uh, there's kind of two big problems or three big problems I see with uh, medical doctors or clinicians when they either counseling patients on diet or talking about nutrition. Thing one, uh, they don't. <laughs> so the first problem is they just, they just won't do it. They won't talk about diet or it'll be the last 15 seconds of an office visit like, hey, and you know, you should really eat better. Uh, or, they, or they throw a pamphlet at them or something, you know. Um, and it's, it's just one of those things. It's like that's not not, not only is eating better too vague to actually be actionable, it's just, you know, uh, it, 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 it's a waste of time. You, you've effectively done nothing for the patient. Uh, thing two is not understanding that accountability and, uh, is probably the biggest driver uh, of success, you know, of the, uh, when it comes to dietary interventions and outcomes like losing weight or improving health metrics, whatever metric you want to talk about, whether that's uh, an A1C, which measures, you know, how well a diabetic's blood glucose has been controlled over the last three months or, um, you know, cholesterol levels uh, for somebody who has elevated cholesterol and that's been deemed a risk factor for their uh, cardiovascular risk. Uh, But so uh, accountability um, tends to be, uh, and as as that pertains to compliance, those tend to be the biggest or tightest correlates to success. So you can't have, if you're trying to counsel somebody on nutrition as a physician, it can't just be, you know, you should do this for 10, you know, 10 minutes at the end of a, a, an office visit and I'll see you in six months. It needs to be, you know, we need to check in on a regular basis or you need to um, join the American Weight Loss Registry or you need to, we have this nutrition counseling service that you need to go to on a weekly basis. It's just, there needs to be more follow-up, right? So that's like just, from a practical perspective. Uh, but as far as thoughts on nutrition and like how they counsel people, we're not as physicians, we're just not educated in nutrition. There's no nutrition course in medical school for most, uh, medical schools anyway. And the nutrition course is basically biochemistry if they have one, you know, so you get to learn all of the enzymes of the Krebs cycle and all the ATP things, uh, which is very impressive if you wanted, you know, uh, woo somebody by, you know, when you're standing at a whiteboard with a dry erase marker, 
but it doesn't really help you understand about practical nutrition changes for a patient. So you've got doctors saying that you can't do low carb diet. It's just bad. And that's, you know, and so the first question that I would ask if I were a patient would be, well, why? <laughs> and they don't, they don't have a why. And if they do, they're lying to you, you know, or if you brought up, uh, you know, intermittent fasting, um, and the doctor would say, uh, I don't know about that. That's, mm, I'm not sure. And it's just because it's just a lack of education in that area. So if they don't understand or haven't heard about something, I think they just feel like they have to give an opinion on it versus saying, versus saying, I don't know. And, and, and I know, you know, a lot of my mentors have said that, you know, the greatest thing you can say is a doctor is, I don't know. And I agree, but then they just don't do it. I <laughs> just say, just say, I don't know when it comes to nutrition and call me over. I'll, I'll help. Like, uh, I'd be happy to, um, to get in there. Um, so it's, yeah, it's interesting. I, I feel like there's a lack of education and then also a lack of training and how to actually counsel people on how to change certain habits, you know, even if you had all the knowledge, but if you couldn't talk to somebody about how to act practically like implement it, that would be, it'd be very difficult to be successful that way as, you know, as a practitioner. Uh, or if you have no experience helping people and therefore kind of know how to troubleshoot or, uh, what are the things that constantly pop up, you know, when people are trying to make changes, then it'd be hard to be good at doing that. So overall, I think it's a lack of education, a lack of experience, um, with both, not only the pra- the actual, you know, academic side, the knowledge, but then also the practical implementation. Um, it's, it's kind of, it, it, on one hand, it's very upsetting to me that doctors can't and don't really do that. Uh, they don't take the time to learn all of this stuff on their own because I think it's very, very important. Um, and they always say, oh, lifestyle is you know, a huge, huge thing that we need to work on as a, you know, as, a, uh, as a profession as far as counseling people. But on the positive side, since they're not really doing that or nobody's really made a big uh, push to do this uh, publicly, that leaves a nice little market open for me. <laughs> right, so, right, right. I'm, <laughs> I'm torn. Right. It's like if a lot of people were doing this, maybe I wouldn't have a job. I, I don't, I'm not sure. Well, here, let, let's get into that. Um, because you're a strength coach, but you've made a niche for yourself offering dietary consults for um, high performance strength athletes. We're talking CrossFitters who compete at the CrossFit games, powerlifters, et cetera. And I like to get in the nitty gritty of, you know, eating or diet for, you know, strength uh, training. But let's talk big picture first. I mean, there are a ton of diet approaches out there. Uh, and I think diet is the thing that confuses most people, confuses people the most when it comes to strength and fitness. You know, there's paleo, there's low carb, slow carb, intermittent fasting, if it fits your macros, carb backloading, you know, eat six meals, you know, a day that are small. What's your overall approach to diet when it comes to to strength and conditioning, do you fall into any particular school, or do you just are these? Do you see all of them as tools to be used in certain situations? Yeah, yeah. So I think that's probably the latter. You know, all of these tools are things that I've used at different times. Um, so you know, that's a broadly speaking. But I guess if you had to, you know, gun to my head, what's your preferred approach? It's probably more of a if it fits your macros kind of approach. And it's become almost so popular these days that I almost feel embarrassed saying it. But the, the thing is, I find that it allows people enough dietary freedom to eat a, a wide variety of foods if they want. So it'll, you know, that tends to be improved compliance for many folks, you know, the, uh, people who would eat like a paleo or a slow carb diet, uh, or even the carb backloading would almost, sometimes feel so limited by what they could eat or when they could eat them that would be hard to be compliant, right? And so they felt like once they would either, you know, mess up or have a little issue that the whole day was blown. And then, you know, there would be some sort of binge eating behavior, which is ultimately bad. And then if it fits your macros, tends to avoid that. Um, But on the other hand, uh, you have people who, they have all these choices now. (laughs) And uh, that's a problem in and of themselves. They almost feel like they have too many choices and that can lead to, you know, uh, if they choose to eat, high sugar, highly palatable foods. Hot, yeah. So like from a palatability perspective, the more fat, sugar, and salt that's in a meal, the more palatable it is. It, it's, there's like a bunch of different food science terms that pertains to that, like how it feels in the mouth, 
the you know savoriness, like all these different categories. But anyway, if you, if they eat too many of like those kind of foods, that can actually cause you know uh, some o- uh, overeating that they otherwise have not planned on, and maybe not they wouldn't have been exposed to had they been on a more rigid diet. So you know, it kind of depends on the person. The just as far as which the preferred approach, but I generally default towards and if it fits your macros, giving somebody a protein level, a carb level, a fat level, and then a fiber goal to hit uh, for the day, and then tend to adjust from there. So even if somebody is what I would say failing and if it fits your macros type approach because they feel like they have too much freedom or it tends to lead to food decisions that ultimately sabotage them, I'll still use kind of that if it fits your macros approach, uh, but just have another like caveat and make it like a, a paleo-esque if it fits your macros to so the food quality is very high um and then that you know you just kind of use whatever tool you need to get the outcome you want um yeah i mean which like duh right you know <laughs> we're gonna use what we have to do to get the job done right, right. 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 Let's talk about, you know, if it fits your macros. And so, yeah, like you said, if it, if it fit your macros is the idea that you, you have a certain amount of protein, carbs, fat, and fiber that you can eat through the day. However sure. you can get those calories or macros is up to you, right? Gives you some choice. But let's yep. talk about um, if it fits your macros in the context of strength training on a progressive program like starting tr- strength or the, the Texas me- method. What should a macro makeup look like for someone who's engaging in strength training? Because it's it's very, you know, because because like the the I guess we can get into like Krebs cycles and ATP because like it's different <laughs> from like running, right? Like you need yeah. different types of source of energy that's different um, from that in in yeah. strength training. Yeah. Well, so okay, let me just like nerd out for a second. The if you have somebody who's running, you know, and so let's say that's just aerobic activity, uh, you could make the argument that that person um, is going to use a lot of carbohydrates and fat during the whatever event they're doing uh, training for. And you would say that depending on how fast they're running, that's going to determine how much carb or fat they're going to actually use. Whereas strength training is almost purely anaerobic in that it just it's using ATP, creatine, and sugar. Effectively, that's what you're using while you're training. So you could make an argument that, oh, well, the strength training might need more you know, carbohydrates than the person who's training for a marathon or half marathon. Uh, but then you have to go down the rabbit hole of, well, how much training volume is actually going on? You know, because the person training for the marathon may actually be running or training you know, 20 plus hours a week versus the person doing starting strength uh, may only be training six to six hours a week, and then it's just you know what are the different body weights uh, and and how how that reacts to a diet. Uh, but so in general, broadly speaking, if you have somebody who's doing like a Texas method or starting strength novice progression, and they are not overweight, um, the idea would be that you're going to fuel them enough such that their weight goes up progressively. All right, the weight should be increasing. And, and this is just uh, no other considerations being made except for we want to get as strong as possible in the most successful way possible. So we're talking uh, weight going up on the barbell, not body weight. Both. 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 Okay. I would say both. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, if you have a person who is effectively not overweight, they can stand to increase their body mass, um, which does a number of things. Thing one, you cannot gain muscle mass, skeletal muscle mass without gaining weight, Period. It just, I mean, and I hate, I never talk in absolutes except for just there and then the statement before that, <laughs> right? I, I, I do, I hate saying always or never or 100% of the time, but it is true. If you are not gaining weight, it cannot gain muscle mass. It, it, you just can't. Even if you're obese, right? Obese, untrained, you start training with the barbell. If you're losing weight, you're not increasing skeletal muscle mass. It's just not happening. So the, like you, the, you can't like gain muscle and lose fat and lose at the same fat. time. No, no. Like, and, and you know, me saying that is probably costing me business, right? If I just lied to people, right? Like, oh yeah, get, you can get really strong and be ripped and be ripped. Yeah, yeah. Be, and if you're not already ripped, right? So it, it's funny. Just as an aside, I promise I'll get back on topic. But if this is something that just irks me. 
you know, you see people on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, the social media world who are super lean and strong and athletic or whatever, and they're just selling coaching, right? And I have no problem with people making money, but the, people are not taking into consideration a handful of things. Thing one, their genetic predisposition, right? So if, if, you're, if you're just rolling around untrained uh, and you're at 9 or 10% body fat, that's just your, you know, what you're working with on a base level, and then you start training, like, hey, you're going to be lean. <laughs> like, just, yeah, you're like, you're, that's you, and you don't have to work hard for that. And it does, that's not a negative. It's just, hey, you're able to support a higher level of strength at a lower body fat than somebody who's not predispositioned to being lean, all right? Oh, uh, and then if you have somebody who's been training for 15 years on top of that, like, <laughs> it's hard to sort of temper people's expectations or ground them in reality when you have that sort of, you know, situation being exposed on, on social media, right? So you have a person who's got really good genetics, been training for a long time, plus or minus drug use. And it's like, that's just not a realistic expectation. So when I have people come to me and say, Hey, I heard you can, you know, gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. I'm like, um, no, no, you're no. Right. Only just if no, you're on just gear no. or something like that. Right. Even, even if, even yeah, if, right. yeah, it's just, I mean, it'd be, you know, again, <laughs> there's multiple studies out there suggesting that it's just not possible. Uh, you may like a small increase in skeletal muscle mass. Maybe if you're on drugs and, and, you know, for a long period of time and you're untrained. And so now, now you're training, maybe, uh, but it's just, yeah, not, not gonna happen. I mean, most of the studies when, when they look at people using steroids or whatever, they're actually gaining weight. And so, but they gain more muscle when they gain weight, when they're on steroids, that's like the thing that they do. Um, so, uh, at any rate, back to the topic, if you're underweight, uh, or not overweight anyway, and you're on a novice progression, the idea is to get as strong as possible. Gaining body weight will allow you to gain muscle mass and a bigger muscle is a stronger muscle. All other things being equal. That's thing one thing two. If you're gaining weight, that tells me that the uh, metabolic and, bio, uh, and uh, physiological milieu that is occurring in your body is such that your recovery is maximized from a food perspective, from a nutritional perspective. Because if you're gaining weight, you're not at a deficit, right? You just have enough fuel, enough resources to go around um, to remodel, repair, and otherwise recover from training. Now, that's not taking into account sleep. That's not taking into account you know, environmental stressors like your girlfriend or boyfriend broke up with you or, you know, <laughs> you're having a tough time at the job at, at work. But at least from a nutritional perspective, we've sort of maxed out on recovery. That kind of makes sense. That makes like, sense. Right. Yeah. So if now on the other hand, if you have somebody who is, uh, I mean, Brett, how much do you weigh? I weigh you're, 210 now. I'm, so you're, I'm, I'm kind of in a cut phase. I was at 220. Um, but Reynolds has me on a fewer, a little fewer calories right now. You trying to be? You're just trying to be sexy. I'm trying to be it. sexy. I got I got really strong, um, and I, I, I got, saw that you pulled 500, right? I, I, yeah, I deadlifted 500. Oh, that's um, awesome, man. But I, I I just wanted to lose a little bit of body fat, but but because of that, like my strength has gone down a bit. So you understand? I mean, you're right. And so you're what I'm telling you is no surprise to you. You're like, duh. Like if you <laughs> if the calories are low enough for you to lose weight, is very difficult to sustain a linear progression of any sort unless the recovery periods are very long so in the novice phase for instance your recovery period is 48 hours right and if you're losing weight it is very difficult to recover from that uh, to recover from you know day one to day two and progress on a texas method it's difficult to do to recover within a week if you're losing weight so because that's you, your nutritional status is such that you're not maximizing your recovery um so you either have one or two choices if you're trying to lose weight. Either you accept that your your rate of strength improvement is going to be lower, all right, or slower rather, uh, or you just say, "Hey, you know what? I'm I'm going to uh, attempt to change my training in a way that my recovery period's longer." So that might be a person doing Texas method where the weight goes up every other week, or that they have an extra light day. You know, so it'd be volume day, light day, light day intensity day the following week you've just stretched out the recovery period to try to allow that to happen because um, you're just having less resources contributing towards recovery uh, 
But at any rate, if, if you have somebody who's trying to get as strong as possible, they're not trying to cut. Right. Just, just, just not, you know, it's like, uh, but that, and then it should be noted that that's different than trying to get as competitive as possible in a, in a weight class sport. That's not the same thing. You know, um, people will say, well, you know, Jordan, you're a 198 pound or two, you know, uh, or a 93 kilo lifter and you're, you, how come you don't gain weight? Uh, <laughs> and it's like, well, I'm, you know, fairly competitive in my weight class. Although if you ask Ripito, he would say, that I'm massively underweight. Yeah. Rip will always <laughs> say you're underweight, no matter what. He told, <laughs> the first time I met him, I was, uh, I think I was 178 pounds or no. Yeah. I just had weighed in 176 at, at a meet previously. And he's like, uh, <clears throat> bag and bomb, you'd be a real good, uh, 275 if you just eat. <laughs> right. Now, <laughs> so, he, he told me that a, a man should weigh at least 200 pounds. You're not a man if you don't weigh 200 pounds. I know. And the first I time know. I met him, I was like 185. And then I, I saw him again like six months later and I'm like, hey, I'm 200 pounds now. He's like, all right, you're a man. Did, like, right. did he call you an ant? Did he say, yeah. No, he didn't call tell me you an, an insect. An <laughs> insect. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, uh, it's funny. He's tempered his recommendation now. I, now when I see him, he says, you know, you just do 242. Come on, right. 242. It's just 242. Like, Right. Um, so yeah, I know that's a, uh, uh, kind of a, a broad question. Like do the, what do you do nutrition wise if you're trying to get strong? And it's like, well, you know, you, you need to, and how's that different between running and, and strength training? It's, I think that on balance, if, uh, someone's not old, uh, not female, uh, and not a vegetarian or vegan, they would be best served by putting their protein at about a gram per pound of body weight, uh, eating a higher percentage of their calories from carbohydrates compared to fat, and then adjusting those two macro inputs, uh, carbs or fat, uh, up or down, depending on what their weight is doing and what they need to do. So if you're trying to gain weight, then you need to add carbs and fat on a weekly basis or you know every other week in order to drive the weight up. You probably don't need to add protein if you're doing one gram per pound. Uh, if you're a vegan, if you're female, if you're old, um, you may need a little bit more protein than that to optimally um, uh, kind of uh, 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 to have enough protein for recovery. Uh, alternatively, if your calories are super, super high, like if you're at 5,000 calories a day, that's a lot of carbs and fat, which all have like trace proteins. So you may need a little bit more protein too, but that whole argument of how much protein is enough to optimize muscle protein synthesis, that's like a rabbit hole that I don't think most people are prepared to go down. Even those who have written about it on the internet, it's just, there's too many complications, too many, too many unknowns to really say confidently, but the gram per pound thing has been, I feel like it's a very practical recommendation, to be honest. Okay. And so yeah. I guess the, the big takeaway here then, you know, you have some specific macro recommendations, but the big takeaway is like, you have to decide what your goal is when it comes yep. to your fitness. You either yep. want to get stronger. If so, you're just have to accept the fact you're going to gain some weight. And if you want to lose weight then you just have to accept the fact that you're not going to get as strong as you would like. Sure. And you know, right. And you know, that's a decision everyone has to make on their own. I would, my bias is that if you're untrained right now, if you're, if you have not touched a barbell or have not gone, been on a formal strength program, then just get strong, just get strong, take 12 weeks out of your life and just get strong. Don't worry about losing weight. Don't worry. Just get strong out. If you're overweight, okay. You don't need to gain weight during this process. Okay. You may be okay. Losing weight slowly during this process. Okay. If you're markedly overweight. If you're just a little overweight, don't worry, but just get strong, right? You have one chance <laughs> to, to really maximize your return on investment at the gym. Just don't worry about losing weight right now. You can do that later, okay? Alternatively, if losing weight is going to make the biggest difference in your life right now, it's going to make you feel better, it's going to make you more social, whatever, it's going to have the highest improvement on your quality of life, then just lose weight. Right. Don't try to do starting strength and lose a bunch of weight. Yeah. It's just, you're setting yourself up for a disaster, right? At best, at best, you just won't have very good results. Okay. At worst, you'll get injured and burnt out and then, you know, end up 20 years later doing yoga and being really skinny, you know, <laughs> which, which is fine. No judgment, no judgment, but. <laughs> strength is awesome. Yeah. 
And I, and I think you know, going to that argument that you know, focus on strength first. I mean, one argument can be made that you know, muscle mass is hard to put on. It's hard to acquire, but it stays around longer. Um, like body fat is easy to shed, right? Like, yeah. And you can just through dieting, you can get that stuff off. I mean, that's like what you know, bo- like old school bodybuilders. They would just get really fat. <laughs> um, and wear sweats, but like they'd gain a lot of muscle mass. And then when, as it got closer to competition, well, they just diet down and they'd lose yeah. muscle in the process, but they lost all that fat too. Yeah. It's, it's to me, uh, mu- your, the amount of muscle mass you can acquire is your 401k. It's super persistent. It's, you know, hard to get stays around, you know, despite, even if you were, people will argue in the common circles, they'll say, they'll say, you know, if you stop working out, the muscle is just going to turn to fat, which is <laughs> <laughs> so. I mean, or it's fat just not, turns it, to muscle. You can turn fat it, turns to muscle. Yeah, so magically just to, do that. You may, yeah, geez, if I made a supplement that did that, we'd be we'd be millionaires. Uh, it there's just so neither of those happen. The other thing is, even if you were to stop training, okay, the muscle mass that you have acquired persists. It can it just stays there. Your muscles will get a little smaller because you're storing less glycogen in them. The uh, amount of pro extra protein, non contractile proteins that you have in the muscles will be a little less. So the actual diameter or size of the muscle will be a little less, but you lose very little muscle mass with when you don't train, unless you're on like bed rest in a cast. You know, like that's that's the time, or you have like a, a muscle losing. A disease like age, or you got a, you were it burned really badly, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, it's you're not going to lose it. It's you're just you've spent the time to acquire all this muscle mass that's going to pay off later. Um, and so, I think most people. I mean, granted, we do have an obesity epidemic here in the United States. Um, I just feel like we all of our methods to combat that have been un- wildly unsuccessful. You know, just, oh, just eat less and do more walking, right? That's just been wildly unsuccessful. So I'm like, well, why don't we just have people strength train? It's motivating for a lot of people because you see the progressive results, okay? I know that it's going to improve uh, metabolic function, you know, or at least has a high potential to, okay? The positive sort of feedback cycle from you put in the work, you get to go up, you get, you get better is, uh, you know, it's good rewards to get people to buy in and, and be compliant, all right. And then you can leverage that into changing nutritional habits. Right. So like if you're my client uh, and you and I, are, and I, you know, we're training together or whatever. And you say, hey, look, Jordan, it's great. My squat's going up. My, my strength numbers are getting better. How do I take this to the next level? You know, what's, what, what do I need to do nutritionally? You know, that's that for that's an easy in versus versus, well, you should just walk more and, uh, and eat less. There's no there is no sort of positive feedback loop in that there's no sort of way to leverage your walking improvement to dietary changes. So I kind of think, let's just get people under a bar, get and have them get stronger, and then we can address the nutrition along the way. If they need to lose fat after this linear progression, then let's do that. But Okay. That's, yeah. some, that's some solid advice. All right. So you can't have it all. You have to pick your poison. You can't have it. You cannot have it all. You can't have it all. All right. Well, let's, here's a, here's a kind of more specific question. Um, you know, if you're on a linear progression or like a Texas method, there's always a chance you're going to become overtrained where your body can no longer uh, make the adaption, recover fully. Um, how should diet change if you're starting to feel overtrained? Okay. Well, so you and I are assuming that there is such, you can be overtrained. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's, there's some, I, uh, some people would argue there's no such thing as being overtrained. It's just under recovered. But then you're like, well, what is under recovery? Isn't that just the same thing in a different word? I, I don't know. I, another podcast, maybe. But uh, as far as dietary changes, when someone's overtrained, I think first you have to identify what was the nidus for becoming overtrained. Why did someone get to a point where they can no longer progress at the same interval as they were previously? Was it not enough stress? That is, like on a Texas method, uh, if volume day drives intensity day, and intensity day drives volume day. They're kind of synergistic in that that respect. Was is was one or both of the stimuli not enough to allow you to improve? And if that's the case, then the dietary change it, is moot. There's no dietary change. It's just one of those variables needs to change. 
Um, or was it that there was not enough recovery time between stress applications, right? So if the if there's not enough recovery between stress applications, then you can make the argument that increasing dietary intake, uh, increasing energy intake, so by, mostly by more carbs uh, and fat, may aug- may may correct for that. So if someone has a really good intensity day, they're able to go up like they planned, they hit the reps. And then volume day comes around and they just get crushed. You might make the argument that there was not enough recovery that occurred between intensity day and volume day. And providing more fuel may augment that. You could also make, but then you'd also have to make sure that, hey, there were no extra life stressors that occurred in this interim. So again, girlfriend or boyfriend didn't break up with you, like (laughs) didn't have like a deadline at work to meet. And, you know, because we've got pretty good evidence that, uh, psychological stress is actually more taxing than physical stress uh, as far as per, you know uh, uh, performance is concerned. So if you ruled out all of that other stuff, sleep is good, no extra psychological stress, you know, no you know massive equipment changes or whatever, then you're saying, well, maybe just not enough recovery occurred. In which case, adding more fuel may that would be the first line sort of treatment. So. Yeah, a small change, you know, 100 calories, 200 calories is a good idea. I, I'm not in favor of people going out. It, it's, it's funny. People will, oh, I've got a big squat day tomorrow, a big volume day. I'm going to go out tonight. I'm going to have pizza, pasta, wing, the whole thing, right? And then they show up the next day. They feel terrible, just a bloated mess. It's like, you know, their face is three times their normal size, all right? Their belt doesn't fit right. All of their warm-ups feel terrible. They feel sluggish. And they're like, but I ate so much yesterday. I should be fueled up. And it's like, no, I, that's just not the way That's not the way it works. I, I would have taken somebody's base diet and added like 50 grams of carbs, 10 grams of fat, and uh, just see how they do. Just a small change, a little more fuel, see how you do. There's no reason to just you know dump a bunch of fuel in there and hope it works out. You just feel terrible. Right, no carb day. loading. No, I, you know, yeah, the... the especially for weight training, it's just, what's the point? Right. Especially, especially if you can't use your belt, like if you're normally on your third hole on a belt and now you have to use your second hole because you're so bloated, it's like you've just changed the mechanics of all of your lifts. Yeah. So now, so now your, your mechanical, your technical mastery has, uh, gone down just because you ate an extra plate at the buffet. Yeah. Okay. So don't do that. Well, let's talk about another topic. So I've done intermittent fasting before, and I've enjoyed it. I mean, it's just, it simplifies your life. You don't have to like, sure. worry about a meal. But uh, how can intermittent fasting affect strength training? Is it, are there benefits to it? Or are there a lot of downsides where you just be like, well, you'd probably be better just sticking with uh, if you fit your macros type of routine? Uh, okay, uh, that's a good question. I'll give you the TLDR. Uh, it probably doesn't matter that much. I, that's what my ultimate thought on it. It probably doesn't matter that much. From a very nerdy academic side, I could make the argument that any period of fasting, um, any any period of fasting uh, that's that's different than what you where you would normally fast on an if it fits your macros type approach, because we everyone fasts while they sleep, right? So, uh, but the extra let's say eight hours waking hours that you're fasting on intermittent fasting compared to an if it fits your macros type approach is time spent not. Uh, uh, undergoing muscle protein synthesis. So effectively, a person who's doing an if it fits your macros type approach could have two or three additional bouts of muscle protein synthesis over the course of a day where an intermittent fasting person couldn't just because they're not eating. All right. Uh, does that you know, make a difference at six weeks, 12 weeks, six months? I don't know. I, I think it does. You know, I think if you were a high level athlete, you know, and you're working out multiple times per day uh, or competing multiple times per day, then I think the argument becomes a little clearer as to you probably shouldn't do intermittent fasting just because your recovery time is so short. But if someone's doing like a Texas method or a starting strength thing and they want to do intermittent fasting, I'd be really hard pressed to say that intermittent fasting won't work because you have so much time between sessions, Right. The bigger problem is how, if you can't get enough food in that window to, to make your body weight do what it needs to do, then ultimately I think it's, it's not a good approach. But for, for weight loss, you know, I've had people do it just because it simplifies their life. 
it almost is like a, it prevents them from eating too much and they feel full. So, okay. That's some good yeah. insights there. Let's, let's talk about this. Cause this is something that people debate all the time on the, the forms and on the you know, blog posts is, it, you know, pre and post workout nutrition, right? Sure. All these things are, you have the magic window and there's a magic window. If you <laughs> consume things at this magic hour, then like you will just put on muscle mass and not fat. <laughs> uh, right. So, I mean, what's your approach to pre and post workout nutrition? Sure. Um, so pre and put my general like rule of thumb is right when you're walking into the gym, uh, ideally someone would have <clears throat> five to 10 grams of BCAAs. Um, they could have their creatine, uh, three to five grams of creatine monohydrate, only type of creatine someone should be using and, uh, plus or minus some beta alanine plus or minus some betaine anhydrous, also known as TMG, uh, plus or minus caffeine if they're into that. And the uh, general caffeine dose that's been shown to be effective is about three to nine milligrams per kilogram, which is much greater than a cup of coffee. But anyway, that's just my general pre-workout recommendation, which is on the Starting Strike Nutrition Forum, and it's like all over the place. And then post-workout is the exact same, minus the creatine, minus the caffeine. So effectively, you got BCAAs, you got beta alanine, betaine anhydrous. Those are all really well-studied uh, supplements. And, uh, and creatine and caffeine. I mean, that's very simple, very basic, not sexy, but it's, you know, somewhat evidence-based and, uh, seems to work, work so pretty well. What does it do? Like what is like BCAAs yeah. and all these things? What is the purpose yeah. of them? Sure. So BCAAs effectively is whey protein on steroids. Uh, it's the BCAAs, uh, leucine, isoleucine and valine, and they, uh, effectively will stimulate muscle protein synthesis in and of themselves. Um, so you got a little muscle, uh, muscle fuel to sim simplify it. Uh, beta alanine is increases, uh, uh, carnosine, which is a buffer, um, at the level of the muscle. So it's been shown to, uh, increase time to fatigue. So if it normally took you, you know, eight reps to become fatigued, now you could do 10 reps. So it tends to uh, support a little bit greater volume, uh, tolerance or, or exercise tolerance. Um, creatine does a number of things. It's really well studied. I, everyone says that, which is, it is true. Creatine does a number of things. Thing one, it increases water at the level of the muscle. Um, it actually draws water into the cells, which is good. So, cause a hydrated muscle cell is an anabolic muscle cell. And so in fact, if you were <clears throat> to try to buy a creatine that said, Oh, it doesn't, you don't retain water on, with this creatine. Then effectively what they've told you is the creatine is not useful. That, that's actually one of the, it's one of the ways that it works. Right. So, uh, yeah, creatine monohydrate does that thing too. It actually increases, uh, muscle satellite cell, uh, uh, recruitment. So after you train, you have a bunch of damaged muscle tissue and you have satellite cell recruitment to the level of the muscle. It helps repair, regenerate, and ultimately make new, uh, muscle cell nuclei, which are called myonuclei. Each myonuclei is responsible for a certain area of muscle. And the more myonuclei you have, the more, uh, muscle protein you can synthesize per bout of muscle protein synthesis. So that's one of the things testosterone does. Testosterone increases the number of myonuclei at the level of a muscle, which means that every time that you're exposed to a stimulus that causes muscle protein synthesis, you can generate more muscle protein, which means your muscles get bigger. So creatine does that, but on a much lower level than testosterone. Uh, the other thing that creatine does is increase intracellular energy sources. So that's ATP effectively. So which is why there was some study for using creatine in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, all these neurological diseases, uh, cerebral palsy as well. Um, it's been really well studied, super safe. There's no contraindications to using creatine. Everyone should use creatine. Your grandma, <laughs> your mom, like everyone in your family should be on creatine, in my opinion. Um, so anyway, that's way too much than anyone ever wanted to know about creatine. That's one of the things I recommend. Uh, betaine anhydrous is a effect. It's from beets, made from beets. It's an antioxidant. Um, it basically helps drive muscle protein synthesis uh, by combating uh, free radicals at the level of the muscle. So it, it's been it's effectively been dubbed the new creatine. So and it's actually yeah it's pretty well supported. So I like that just very simple. It's a pre workout post workout nutrition. You kind of get all your supplementation done for the day. Uh, but the idea that there's this like post workout window that you must 
get all of your food in because it's magical is BS. And it is true that as you, you know, let's say you finish your workout at time zero, it absolutely 48 hours later from that, the rate of muscle protein synthesis is less. That is true. Okay. But it's nearly maximal for most of the 48 hours until it finally tapers off. So that means that if you got done training at time zero and you didn't eat anything until two hours later, you're fine. It, you're still taking advantage of that post-workout window. And if you're only training three times per week, this is a non-issue. Post-workout nutrition is a non-issue. If you're training multiple times per day or competing multiple times per day, then absolutely post-workout nutrition is much, much more important. Okay, But for the average person who's training a handful of times per week, it's just not. I just like people will ask me, what kind of carbs should I use post workout? I'm like, I mean, I don't know what kind of carbs do you like to eat, like potatoes, rice, or whatever you want. It doesn't matter. It really, it really doesn't matter. The only kind of hard line I have on this is your pre and post workout meals should ideally be lower in fat than your other meals. That's like the only. Why is that? Yeah. So if you put a gun to my head and said, Jordan, where should I partition most of my energy? I would say, hey, let's make your pre-workout meal, the actual meal you have, a little higher in carbohydrates. And let's make your post-workout meal a little bit higher in carbohydrates. Just because uh, to the effect that this nutrient partitioning effect of the workout is real, which it's a little real, but overall not, not doesn't really matter. Um, we can use, we can leverage that, right? This is especially important or more important, I'll say, in somebody who's trying to lose weight or who's trying to optimize body composition. It's just a little thing we can do to try to, you know, tip, you know, tip, tip the scale towards where, how, uh, the direction we want to go. And so if the meal is higher energy in carbohydrates, then I would prefer to keep fat lower so that, uh, <laughs> we can use fat in other meals to make other meals more satiating, right? Versus them just being protein only like it's high protein low carb low fat that would be you know not very a not very full or rewarding meal for most folks and then additionally uh fat tends to slow down uh the emptying of the stomach uh, gastric emptying so your the amount of when you take in a meal it would actually not get into your small intestine and then not into your bloodstream as quickly if you have a bunch of fat or fiber with that meal so having a bunch of fat in the meal would actually slow down any sort of time related uh process that we're trying to trying to push so if we're trying to get fuel into the system to augment recovery i probably wouldn't i probably keep fat low and then finally as a third thing imagine you have this high energy meal a lot of carbohydrates because you're following my recommendation uh and then you also have a bunch of fat well you're gonna push carbohydrates into the muscle yeah that's true but any extra is going to be stored as fat and any extra fat is also going to be stored as fat so there's, there's really no reason to have a super high energy meal um, that has both energy components post-workout. I feel like there's enough sort of negatives to the situation that you might want to just, any other meal, just put fat in it. Uh, you know, uh, would, it, would it matter over the course of a year? Mm, I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. But it's just kind of, I just have this bias towards low fat pre and post-workout. So that's okay. just my. That's awesome. And, and I mean, so you mentioned some supplements that you do recommend. Are there any supplements that you see a lot of guys taking that are just like, that's a waste of money. You're just pissing that away. Yeah. Well, I mean, so many. Um, <laughs> the, um, well, you remember the deer antler. Yeah. X deer pack. velvet or whatever. Deer. Yeah. Actually, there's a company, I think it's like tens performance. It's like pushing it in the CrossFit scene. And it's, I mean, it's just bullshit. It, it's uh, so if you could take hormones like an insulin, so IGF-1 is what it's supposed to improve. So that's insulin-like growth factor one. Uh, if you could take insulin by mouth, then diabetics wouldn't have to give themselves injections, right? So, you know, pharma, pharmaceutical sales is, is heavily invested in getting orally available insulin agents, and they haven't been able to figure it out yet. Uh, so, yes, the deer velvet, you know, extract, whatever the hell it is, deer antler, stuff. Does it have um, IGF-1 in it? Yes, but you can't absorb it. Uh, people taking glute like these antioxidant supplements, it's dumb. There's no reason, no evidence to support that. Uh, people taking um, ZMA, 
oh, it helps me sleep better. I mean, the magnesium is kind of a sedative. We give it to pregnant women if they're hypertensive or there's like a seizure risk or whatever. But ZMA is not, there's, I wouldn't take it. Um, it also will make you poop a lot if you overdose on the magnesium. <laughs> well, I mean, just say it. You it's know, the magnesium, yeah. Yeah, good or bad, right? Um, the glucosamine chondroitin stuff, um, the evidence is very, very poor on it. In fact, the evidence right now suggests that uh, the gl- the uh, glucosamine uh, chondroitin, it's con- when it's connected to a sulfate molecule, that it's actually maybe the sulfate that is effective. Um, and interestingly, you in Australia, that's prescription only. If it's connected to a sulfate, if it's connected to another molecule, which is, uh, if it's chelated to another molecule, yeah, it's not prescription. Um, other dumb things, melatonin, uh, on balance, melatonin makes you fall asleep about two minutes faster, <laughs> but doesn't have any evidence that restoring sleep architecture or making you sleep better. It's got a really short half-life, but placebo effect is real. So, you know, if, if you're listening to this podcast and you like melatonin, like don't stop taking it. It's just <laughs> placebo effects, very real. Um, pretty much anything that's ever been marketed to CrossFitters. So, uh, <laughs> anything from Progenex or, uh, uh, pure pharma or it's pretty awful. Like it just, it's overpriced. Like progen X has a fish oil, or a fish protein. It's $95 or something per container, which is outrageous. Um, and it's under the guise that it's better, but whey protein is the king, right? And it's fairly inexpensive. Uh, so you're paying double for fish protein. It's, you know, it's not any better. They're just luring you in by saying it's better and it's not. Um, whey protein concentrate is actually like the, one of the cheapest whey proteins you can get. And if you can tolerate it, it's, it's better. When I say tolerate it, there's a, there's a molecule uh, in the protein called beta-lactalbumin, which is, sometimes messes with people's GI tracts. So they'll like take whey and they'll be like, oh, I get a little queasy. And in that case, I'd recommend like a whey protein isolate. Um, that's the only time I would recommend an isolate over a concentrate, though, because concentrate's cheaper, has a higher leucine content, which is one of the BCAAs we were talking about, and uh, is cheaper. So I would recommend that. Um, yeah, but it, it's just all that stuff. It's like it's overpriced. It's not effective, right? And I feel like if you're going to spend your money on something, it should be worthwhile. You know, so these bunch of crooks out there is the deal. It uh, makes me upset, yes. as you may or may not have noticed. <laughs> right? No, yeah. Spend money on actual food. Right. Use right. Or money. don't. Or yeah. Or save it. Or save you know. It. Donate it. There's a bunch of charities that could you you know like research uh, could use your money. I could use your money. Just <laughs> my PayPal. And, no. <laughs> Send me a donation. Hire Jordan as a diet right. consultant. Well, so yeah. Speaking of like Jordan, this has been a great conversation. I mean, we've got into some nitty gritty. We nerded out on a lot of topics. Um, but you've got a lot of great content on your website, Barbell Medicine. Where can people find out more about your work and possibly work with you as a diet consult? Sure. Yeah. Um, so do nutrition and programming consultations and uh, like lifestyle stuff. Um, <clears throat> so the website, barbellmedicine.com, there's a contact form there. Uh, social media, it's Jordan underscore Barbell Medicine on Instagram. Uh, my Facebook is open and public. Uh, or you can email me. It's uh, info at barbellmedicine.com. Happy to talk about anything. The more scientific, the better. Or if you just want to talk, tr- talk training, I'm always available. So. Awesome. Well, Jordan Feigenbaum, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. All right. Have a good day, man. My guest today was Jordan Feigenbaum. He's a medical doctor, starting strength coach, and diet consultant. You can find more information about his work at barbellmedicine.com. <laughs> 